jump right into it. Great. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, Erica, thanks so much for joining me on the Hot Drinks Podcast. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you. You've got some stories that I've heard about, but uh, I want to I wanna hear your side of the story and um, yeah, get into a bit more of your career with Knowles and um, see what you're, what you're going on to now. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start off with your favorite hot drink when you were in the field. So you haven't worked for Knowles since uh, I guess 2008, 2009, but it's been a while, but when you're in the field, you probably still get out. What's your favorite hot drink? Um, so probably, and I know this is not my everyday drink, but, uh, I have such fond memories of, um, chai in the field. Mm. And this was like a specialty of Marco Johnson's that you'd take one Bengal spice tea bag and one black tea bag, and it would make a really delightful little chai with some oh, butter milk and a little sugar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, not, I, I, I heard Kate Coon's, uh, podcast, <laughs> you know, it's not like legit Indian right. tie, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, tie, but <laughs> yeah. a poor man in Alaska, a poor lady in Alaska. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, shy, for sure. I might have to try that because we get bangle <laughs> spice all the time, but I've never done that. I, I like it. Yeah. Marco it's would know his hot drinks. He does know. You, you, you rarely ever see him without something in his hand that, that is hot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if he's not running. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. I, I'm going to have to try that one for sure. Um, all right. Well, let, let's jump into your stories. Um, maybe let's just start off with the big one, uh, with the bang. And, and let's talk about your, your 2002 Denali expedition. Uh, this is a, a legendary uh, story uh, course at Knowles. It's a, a Denali climb that uh, is an alumni course only. So it's only for alumni. And uh, I happen to be at the branch um, during before during before during and after i think this expedition went down and um had a really good friend that was one of your co-instructors that i just did a climb with before you started um <laughs> so i'm familiar with this trip but i'm excited to hear your side of the story so let, let's give us a bit of backstory and and take us through that expedition and all the epicness that transpired Great. sure yeah no it's, epic is a good word for it um so and just i'll preface it by saying this is nearly 20 years ago right so 2002 a long time this is my believe. memory yeah, right? It feels like it was not that long ago. Yeah. Um, so this is my memory, and I imagine it's not truth with a big T, but I'll, I'll tell what my memory um, tells me, and we'll, we can, you know, maybe you can have Marco on the show. We'll get Marco on one of these days to straighten it out. <laughs> yeah, like, um, so, and, and the bit of preface is that, so I was really lucky that when I was quite young, I was 17 years old, I, I was sent up to Alaska to work on a trail crew. Um, and just absolutely, I, I'm from the Pacific Northwest originally and just totally fell in love with Alaska. Um, so spent that summer in the Kenai. The next summer I returned to work as a backcountry ranger in Denali National Park. And I was just wow. a baby. I was 18 years old. Yeah. Spent the next summer, 19-year-old summer, back yeah. in the backcountry uh, in Denali National Park. And as a backcountry ranger, I spent all this time kind of in the lowlands of the park staring up at Denali. And just, mm. I had no mountaineering experience at the time. I just was like dreaming, dreaming, dreaming of someday getting to climb this amazing, beautiful, majestic mountain. Um, and so, you know, this is just a place and a mountain that's, you know, for whatever reason, um, had me by the tail and uh, is really, really dear to me. Um, and so I started working for Knowles in, in 1995. Um, and you know, there's a progression, right? So you, you, and I was young. And so I yeah. sort of started with that progression of working wilderness courses and winter courses and Canyon courses. And, you know, always with this ultimate goal of, of being an Alaskan on near, right? That right. was like, now I'm just going to jump in when, when you say you were young as an instructor, you know, you said you were like 20 years old when you took your instructor's course. And I believe around that time, you know, the average, I'm not sure what it is today, but the average age of an instructor course student or candidate was about 27 so and the yeah. average like instructor was about 32 or early 30s so you're super young I was super young yeah and which you know which made it kind of an interesting dynamic with students right because I was essentially same yeah. age as most of our students um and and uh you know I, what I, I I'm learned gonna, I'm gonna cut you off again <laughs> when you say that because yeah, that no. just brought a great memory of a good friend of both of ours that has passed away AJ Linnell mm -hmm. and I was working a a, wind, uh, a mountaineering section of a semester in Pacific Northwest in the fall. And it was mountaineering section and I was working and it was the first day, it was the first part of their um, semester. And, and the student that you could tell pretty early on, like even at the branch that he's going to be a bit of trouble. Um, and he sits down, we're sitting down at the picnic table, having dinner. And he looks at us and says, 
y'all both seem to be a little young to be working this thing, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I just laughed at that. You know, what do you respond with? And and sure enough, like two days in, and he sees like AJ carrying his pack and someone else's pack and, and a mountaineering rack and a couple other things. And he's just like, all right, I got nothing. Well, and that's just that was like that. And I'm was sure your students like, like it only I, took a day I for them to realize. To, I mean, I went in just super nice, very unassuming, humble, whatever. And then like if I had those students, and they were typically like the 22 year olds now. Yeah who would challenge me, I would just hike them into the ground. I'd right, just, like, I bet. carry more stuff and hike longer and hike faster. And then they'd be like, oh, okay. Like you just broke me. <laughs> right, I bet. <laughs> okay. That must've been fun. So, I mean, sometimes, I mean, yeah. I, you know, it's not what I wanted to do necessarily, but it was right. like, it was the way that I could like, essentially at some point get some credibility with them. Absolutely. You know, it's just like, okay, you know, like I got this and I got some things to teach you if you're open to learning, but um. But yeah, no, there was a lot. And I think that I had to, it really developed my soft skills a lot. You know, like mm. I really had to, I was, I was good at connecting with students and then connecting, you know, in a way that was meaningful to them. Um, and then over that time, I was developing my hard skills um, with this vision of being an Alaska mountaineer. Right. Um, and, you know, and at that time too, in the nineties, like it was a very male dominated. There were very mm. few female mountaineers at the pool. Um, so, you know, there's kind of a, a dual mission, right? Which was, I was young and I was a female and I just really had to work for it to, um, and you know, and I probably lacked confidence too. So, um, were so, there any instructors, senior instructors that you looked up to at that time? Do you remember? Um, I don't remember. I mean, there were definitely, I don't remember there being any like female Alaskan yeah. mountaineers that I really was like, oh, you can, you know, you yeah. can teach me everything I yeah. need to know. There were, there were many men and definitely Absolutely. I learned from them. Um, Andy Tyson, who um, yeah. passed away in the same plane crash as AJ, but he was a great mentor for me. I mean, he wow. was so open and, and willing to teach and um, trying to think, you know, and, and Lizzie, Liz Ramsey and I kind of came up mm. through the ranks together and Sean Benjamin. Right. And so I think the three of us kind of worked you know, like yeah. we go on, you know, personal trips and, and uh, hone our skills, all of this, you know, sort of not knowing anything and figuring it out together. Um, so anyway, fast forward 2002, um, I had at that point worked several Alaska Mountaineering courses and was kind of, you know, settling into like, okay, I, I'm confident, I'm competent, I'm ready to do this and had the opportunity to go climb Denali um, with, with Mills. And, uh, and so the Knolls, um, most people climb Denali from the south side on the Just, West Buttress. That's kind of the trade route. When, when you got that contract, was that something you'd asked for? Was, how, how did it come? Because a lot of times when we get contracts, there's a story behind it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, Especially that I'm contract. Sure, yeah, right? It's a, it's a little bit of a golden contract. Um, I'm sure I'd asked, and, but I don't remember the circumstance. I mean, I remember okay. being thrilled that yeah. I had the opportunity to, to do okay. it. And had you been um, on Denali before, at personal trips or anything? Not. I mean, I climbed around in the Alaska range, but I'd yeah. never tried to climb okay. before. And so, um, you know, very familiar with the route, very familiar with the area, but not the actual summit piece. Um, so, so most people climb down from the south side. They go up the West Buttress, which is kind of the trade route where most of the guided climbs happen. And Knowles climbs from the north side. And, you know, the, the, it's called the Muldrow route because it comes in on the Muldrow Glacier. Um, and it's really remote. And I think that's why Knowles chooses it, is that you very rarely see any other groups on the route. Maybe you might see one. Um, but the, the, the hitch is that it's a 22-mile approach to even get on the glacier. So climbing from the south side, you fly in, you're already at 7,000 right. feet, and, you know, you get plopped on the glacier, and up you go, and you're just already mountaineering. Um, and on the north side, you drive into the park, and then you have a 90-mile bus ride into the middle of the park, and you land yourself at Wonder Lake, and um, and you've got these enormous packs, and then you have to cross the McKinley River, which is this mile-wide river, um, right. which, with, with which braids. in and of itself, with, yeah, with lots of braids. I know you talked <laughs> about braids before, I don't know, I guess. Um, and so, you know, typically there's a fair bit of scouting that goes on, and, and sometimes, you know, I've definitely spent a lot, I logged a lot of time on that river prior to this time, just mm. as a ranger, and, you know, and there's times where it's totally uncrossable at that time of year, so J June, uh, right. mid-June. Um, and it can take a lot of work. I, my recollection of this course was that it was easy breezy and we went down there, we scouted a bit and then we were on our way. Um, and the other, the other piece of the climb is that, um, that's really cool and unique is that, um, because the Muldrow Glacier is part of the wilderness area of the park, there's no mechanized, um, mm. transportation that goes in. 
So the cash of gear right. and some food right. and fuel all goes in by dog sled in the winter time. So it's this that like, so cool. I don't, you may have been at the branch. Yeah, yeah. Where like late in August, maybe early September, we pack up all these wooden boxes full of food and fuel. And then we, we set it aside and storage. And then in midwinter when conditions are good, probably usually around like March, um, dog sled team will take it into the, to the glacier itself and, and leave this cache on the, on the glacier for the, the course to pick up. So, um, so anyway, we, there we were, um, so we had a group of, uh, 12 students and All right, just back to the cash. So they're not, um, yeah. obviously it's in winter, they're, like if they bury it, it doesn't really make a difference because it's going to melt out by the time you get there. So you, they're not, they're not, they're not trying to bury it. They're just um, trying to keep it safe. So a bear doesn't open it. Yeah. And so okay. they, I mean, I think as my recollection of that time is that the, the system was we'd create these wood and we'd build all these wooden crates. Yeah. And then, you know, just nail them shut. Right. Um, and then when we return, we actually would just have a big bonfire and burn all yeah. the crates and that would be that. And there'd be right. a few buckets and whatnot that, um, of, of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, bears aren't actually a huge issue at the, at the toe of the glacier. Um, it's more ravens. Mm. Right. <laughs> um, so you know, typically the cache is quite intact. I don't know that there's, you know, been years of the cache being broken into or, you know, terrible, terrible. I mean, it would be a huge bummer if you had, you know, done your yeah. again and realized, oh gosh, we have, we have no food. Right. <laughs> um, so, so there we were, we had 12 students, we had three instructors, one aide. And so she was a full Knowles instructor, but n- very, relatively new to Alaska Mountaineering. So the idea in this aide position was to give Andrea a chance to, you know, be a part of this big expedition, get more Alaska Mountaineering skills under her belt and help us. But, you know, it's a huge help to have that kind of fourth instructor um, who doesn't get paid for the course, but is kind of, it's a win-win, you know, they're helping the yeah. course. And, and then she was getting the, the learning and the experience. Um, so my recollection of those early days was like, everything was super smooth and we just, we crossed the river easily and it's you know, mosquito-y and boggy, but there's essentially a trail that goes all the way from, the south side of the river all the way across um, and up and up through the tundra and, and up onto the glacier. Um, and then you get, you get to the foot of the glacier, well, it's not really the foot of the glacier, but you get to the Muldrow Glacier and you're kind of on the moraine next to the glacier. Um, and you begin to pack up your, your loads and kind of assess, you know, what you've got. And what you've got is 30 days of food and fuel that you've got to work your way up the mountain with. Um, mm. So it's totally, you know, self-contained. Um, yeah. You get no re-rations, and you're just um, ferrying loads high, and then coming down, setting up your, you know, setting up your camp, camping low, ferrying high, camping low. And so that whole process, right? You start at 2,000 feet, and you're, you're the summit of Denali is uh, Tish over 20,000 feet. Um, yeah. Is you're just acclimatizing as you go, right? So you're, yeah. you know, you're climbing high, sleeping low, climbing high, sleeping low. Um, and the route is, it's not super technical, but there's a lot of crevasses um, and there's a lot of like objective hazards from track fall and ice fall mm. from above. Um, and again, my recollection of this particular course was like easy, smooth sailing. Like it was just like, we had great weather, the snowpack was great, the, you know, there wasn't a huge crevasse hazard and we just were cruising along, you know, making our way up the mountain. Um, and, you know, it just, it takes some time. And, and meanwhile, um, so all of the, I think you mentioned this, but like this is an alumni course. Mm. So all of the students have, you know, a basic set of skills, but some of those students, you know, maybe their student course was a, a Baja sailing course. Right. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't an Alaska mountaineering course. <laughs> right. They don't necessarily have mountaineering skills. So you're, you know, you're working your way up, you're teaching these mountaineering skills, you're traveling on rope teams, people are learning how to use their ice axe properly. And, um, and getting stronger, right? Yeah. Because, um, you know, you're carrying, I mean, your packs are heavy and you're carrying big loads as you, as you make your way up the mountain. Um, and so, you yeah, know, for you the, those folks who don't know, your packs there. are probably, you know, upwards of 70 pounds and, and up. For... I would say well over most of the time. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. I mean, pounds, coming yeah. off the mountain sure. is like the big, you know, the big huff of like a hundred pound yeah. pack, but, um, working your way up, you're typically in and the like, are you, you have sleds as well, range. packs and sleds or just packs? Yeah. Yeah, okay, there's, so. there's, I mean, not a ton because right. they're, you know, it's not in crevasse land. It's not great right. to land in a crevasse with a sled, but I, yeah, I think we had a few sleds with us. Yeah, so just in um, And then you sleds. get up to a certain point on the mountain where like it's impossible to be carrying a sled. So, but I think up to 10,000 feet, we had a few sleds with us. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're working our way up. We're doing some skills. We're teaching people how to rescue if you fall into a crevasse and, 
Um, and meanwhile, just, you know, moving our food and our fuel up. And so uh, we got up to, so you get up on this ridge, Kirsten's Ridge, um, which it starts to become a little bit more technical and um, you're higher up. Most people start doing the altitude around 10, 12,000 feet. Um, and you get up to the Harper Glacier at 15,000 feet and that's kind of your second to last camp. And then your high camp is up at 17, 17, three. Um, and so we get up to 15,000 feet and we're like, okay, you know, like we've got a ton of time and the weather's been great and students are doing well and everybody's feeling good. And we took a rest day just to acclimatize a bit. And uh, a small crew of us that were feeling good and strong actually ferried a load up to 17,000 feet. Mm and staked out our camp at 17. I think we were right around 17.3. And my recollection again of this day is like, it was bluebird. It was wow. gorgeous. There was like, it, not a whiff of wind. We took our time. And then Glacier Mountaineering, one of the, the protocols is you actually probe yourself a perimeter, right? So you do mm -hmm. a, a sort of a grid, a grid search, a grid search with your probe and you make sure there aren't any crevasses and then you mark out your perimeter and, and that's quote safe so that you, you can any... pitch your tents and live in your camp and not worry about being roped up go yeah. ahead did you have any storm days at this point like it sounds like you're just no. storm days all along <laughs> like it's that seems abnormal because up there like the weather is so fickle and it's you know it's not <laughs> abnormal to be stuck in a tent for for multiple days at a time totally and so you know we kind of had this like charmed course at that right. point you know and really hadn't I mean, honestly, like you, as an instructor, you all sort of hope for a storm so that people's skills, like you get that feedback of like, Ooh, you didn't, you know, you left all mm. your stuff out and it got wet and, you know, you get that sort of like immediate feedback of like, Oh, right. that doesn't work out here. Um, but you know, my, again, we might've had like, you know, a little bit of inclement weather, but there was no storm to speak right. of. And we were having to like, you know, sort of patiently like take rest days because we knew we should rather right. than like, oh, the weather's forcing us to kind yeah. of shut down. That's the hard thing with mountaineering. When it's sunny out, you're like, we got to, we got to go. Yeah, we got to go. go. <laughs> Eventually you're just like, I need a break. <laughs> but you're like, I can't take a break because we could get shut down for a week. Right. And this is, you know, I mean, the Denali course is like 31 days. It's, mm -hmm. it's a long, long-ish course. And you've got these 31 days to, you know, get yourself to the glacier, work your way up, summit and come back down again. Um, but you know, you never know when you're going to get shut down. Right? right. So you're like, okay, you're working against the clock a little bit. Um, so again, we're at 15,000 feet, you know, there's a little bit of altitude illness in the group, but low grade and a couple of us move up and we cash a load and we probe our perimeter. And I, and I really do have this distinct memory of this day because it was so beautiful and not, you know, not a lick of wind and, um, just looking around being like, yeah, this is an amazing camp. Like we're well out of any objective hazard territory nothing can fall on us nothing you know we're going to be exposed to the wind but you can't there's no way around that like the wind just mm. comes off the nolly pass and you, you know you have to build a wall or something but um so and that was drew drew and i and one of the other instructors and i and a group of students did that and then we came back down and um again like a few students are a little struggling with altitude and so i remember that evening coming down and we all met as a group and kind of you know looked around and we're like are we ready like are we ready to move up to this high camp and then like at any point we can make our bid for the summit. And, you know, it, it was kind of looking for everybody to confirm like, yep, I'm ready to do this. Like, you know, cause it's committing, it's committing to move up into that like yeah. high, high camp. One from a like, you can't last that long at 17,000 feet physiologically. You know, you just begin to decline. Like you're not making gains physiologically at 17,000 feet. Right. Um, and then for, I'm just going to jump in for those who don't know, like 17,000 feet on Denali close to the Arctic circle <laughs> in Alaska is different than 17,000 feet in the Himalayas. It's, it is. Uh, there, yeah. there is a lot less oxygen, you know, closer to the uh, Arctic, the Arctic Circle, um, you know, for several different reasons. You know, it's not surrounded by tropical rainforests and, and there's polar ice caps and, and other reasons. But just so folks don't know, because, you know, Everest Base Camp is 18,000 feet and people are like, well, that's not that bad. But it's different in, in, in the high, uh, high Arctic or in, in those latitudes, higher up latitudes. So. Yeah, I mean, I think what they say is the atmosphere thins at, at the high latitudes. And so I think they say, you know, 17 feels more like 20 at the equator or something like that. So you're, right. you're getting up there and your body's not necessarily adjusting all that well. Um, so, you know, we have this round kind of very sincere uh, kind of commitment from all the students. Like, yep, mm -hmm. I'm ready. Yep, I'm ready. And, and, and people feel like also being able to express a little, like a little bit of trepidation, a little sure. bit of like, okay, like this is really happening. You know, it's one thing to sign up for a Denali course <laughs> from your, you know, couch. Right. <laughs> and it's another thing to like be facing that, like, okay, this is getting real. Um, 
so we pack up the next morning and you can see the weather starting to change. And, mm. and I remember again, I'm kind of being like, oh, okay, we're getting a little change in weather and that's interesting. And, but it didn't, didn't feel fierce. It didn't, you know, didn't mm -hmm. feel like impending doom. And so, you know, we all pack up, we kind of confirm with each other again, like, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Let's do this. Were, were you getting any yeah. weather reports? Like this is early days of the sat phone. So you're probably right? not. I, 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 my recollection is yes. Cause we had okay. like, we had a radio and I think that we were getting, and I like, we knew that some system was coming through, but okay. we, there wasn't a sense of what ultimately was yeah. the ferocity of the system. Right. Um, and we thought like we had seven days of food and fuel that we moved up. So we were like, sweet, wow. like, let's get up there. You know, kind of best case scenario is we get up there, we have a couple rest days, maybe we get a little bit of the storm in and then we're, we're feeling good and we go and, you know, but we've got some time to wait out whatever's coming in. So we move up really smooth, easy move. And as we got into that camp, um, you know, for those who haven't been in this scenario, like it is exhausting, even a move from 15,000 feet to 17 free maybe a mile or two is just like it takes everything out of you and so and then you get to camp and you have like your second job which is right. you know to set up your tent build a wall of snow um you know get cooking get all that stuff and so you know predictably there's a few students who are just out of the mix like we tuck them in we get them warm and then the rest of us kind of get down to business um and uh, and again, like it start, you're you're like you're noticing it's starting. The wind starting to kick up a little bit. But we build this beautiful, huge wind wall, at, you know, back of the tent. And we have four tents, four four person tents. So the instructors are in one tent, and then we've got three student tents, kind of all in a row, with this beautiful wind wall protecting it from um, the south. Like there's a big uh, Sonali Pass up there, and that's where all the dominant wind comes from. And we tuck in, and everybody's feeling great. Um, and then, so as the night progresses, the wind starts to pick up and, and we're just sitting in the storm. And I remember, so this was, I think the last day of June, um, that the storm, you know, sort of announces itself. Um, but I remember like three days of just like, all right, we're in a storm, we're hunkering, we're eating, we're playing cards, we're, you know, swapping stories, we're telling jokes. Um, and as the storm progresses, it's getting a little bit more um, fierce. And I remember on that day, like it was July 3rd, um, getting to the point, or maybe it was like the night of July 2nd, I was like, all right, guys, you know, in terms of just counseling students, giving them some some uh, information to work with, like, if you leave your tent, like we're in the perimeter, right? So, you know, we, we designated the safe perimeter. But if you leave the tent, let someone know like where you're going, what you're doing and, you know, like your anticipated time back, you know, like, are you going to the bathroom? Are you going to go shovel? Like, what is it you're doing? And like, and let's not just let someone be away for an hour. You know, like that's not, that's not acceptable. At this point. So starting it's to funny how you have to give those concern. parameters because like a perimeter camp, you know, for those who can't picture it is, is probably, you know, 20 meters wide or so, like yeah. maybe not even that. It's not a big space. not a big space. But I just remember my concern kind of raising and being like, you know, someone easily could get blown, like the, you know, the wind's kicking up to the point, you know, it's probably 20 below outside, the wind's kicking up, like going to the bathroom has become, you know, a, a yeah. chore um, and not to get overly graphic, but at this point we're like pooping in individual bags and then caching them in a designated location because we couldn't keep like a group, um, uh, a group bathroom open and, um, and, and we're having to get out and shovel you know, every two hours or so to keep our tents clear. But we're still managing. In any event, that night, uh, we're cooking dinner. And at this point, we're cooking in the vestibule, right? So, um, you know, most people are hungry in the tent and one instructor is kind of geared up and then in the vestibule with some openings for the, for the fumes to get out. Um, and we were cooking in our instructor tent. Drew was in the vestibule cooking and the rest of us were kind of in our bags, just waiting for dinner, <laughs> drinking our hot drinks. Um, and uh, we hear this like flat and we, and we're like, why are these things like dumping snow on us? Like, why would they be throwing snow on us? And then, and so we all kind of look at each other and I was like, that's rude. And then it happens again. We're like, flap, flap, flap. And we just, I just remember this moment of all of us, like wide eyed staring at each other, grew ripped open the vestibule and our camp is just flattened. And so the, the instructor tent was Spared outside of these like few piles of snow that had been kicked at us but um two of our tents had disappeared like literally flattened with students in them wow. um and one was like half crushed um 
So we like as quickly as possible, like pull, you know, pull all of our outerwear on. And meanwhile, you know, what time of day is this? It's evening. So it's okay. probably like five, six o'clock at night. Um, we pull our, our, you know, warm wear outerwear on and it's, you know, 20 below zero, probably ripping around 40 miles an hour. Enough so that like, you kind of need an ice axe to keep yourself upright. Um, and, and what we saw was like, <laughs> one student had been uh, outside going to the bathroom and he'd been literally thrown out of the perimeter a good like 10, 20 meters outside the perimeter down, like downhill of us. Um, one student tent, they'd been cooking as well. So they were on fire. So the, the vestibule was like <laughs> in flames, <laughs> melting. And they were like collapsed under the nylon trying to like work their way out. Um, and then another tent had been flipped over, um, and flipped over. Camp, camping with knolls, um, you know, <laughs> that, uh, any knoll tent, especially in the mountaineering context is, um, anchored by at least 17 different <laughs> anchor <laughs> points, um, <laughs> and battened down, you know, and it, again, like we yeah. were in full storm conditions. So, I mean, the thing was bomber, um, and somehow been ripped off of its back anchors, flipped over on its head. And again, like students are like in the nylon trying to, to scramble out of their tent. So, you know, tent, tent poles broken and, you know, flames. And uh, we were just like, uh, what's going on? Um, and so, I mean, I have this recollection of like, do we have everybody? Like I yeah. see a student down in the outside the perimeter. And I remember being like, count off, you know? And sure enough, it's like, people are like, okay, one, two, three, four. Um, what, what's and, the weather doing I, now? So, so, sorry, we'll get ahead. I, I just want to get a picture of what that happened though. So, and, and maybe you'll get to this, but so you're in the tent and, and you get like your hair this whap, whap, but like it's bigger than that. You know, like this was a, a an air blast. Is it still that windy and snowing out? What's going on? Or has this passed over now? It's like clear and sunny, but everything is gnarly. No, it's still just ripping out. Okay. So it's, wow. you know, it's blowing, you know, gusts of 50 to 60, but, you know, consistently at 20 to 30, I'd say. I mean, who knows, maybe I'm like sure. wildly off, but enough. I mean, I feel like I always would gauge it by just like, you know, how, how much am I getting blown over? And I All remember right. at this point, like trying to figure out what was happening, but like, I couldn't stand up. So I like mm -hmm. had my ice axe and I'm like angering myself with my ice axe as I'm trying to like find students and get them out of the tent that had collapsed. And um, so it was like mayhem at its best. Um, but we account for all of our students and uh, they're all there. And, um, and we just begin to like collect students, um, get, get the so we had essentially two workable tents and two that were just completely destroyed like there was no hope of saving them um so this process of like getting students into the two remaining tents and like salvaging any gear from the two destroyed tents and trying to like tuck it in a way that's not going to get blown blown away um and meanwhile getting the student like, who'd been blown out of the perimeter <laughs> back into the perimeter and so i like i have this recollection of like throwing him an ice axe like rather than like actually right. going down and like helping the poor guy up i'm like yeah. here have an ice axe. and he had um again if you're not familiar with with noel's like mountaineering we have these booties um and so you have like inner inner like your mountaineering boots are plastic boots with inner boots that um you know lace up but then you also have this booty system that's used on winter courses as well, where you have like these background boots and then you have these big over boots. And he had gone out perfectly reasonably, like in his big background boots. So he didn't have any sort of like tread or oh, cramp on no. or anything. So he's like down, you know, like in his little booties trying to like, you know, scramble his way back up. And he did, he was fine. He came up and, you know, he was like physically totally remarkably fine. Um, so anyway, we, we shuffle everybody into their tents. And, and again, my recollection is we started building a, like a, a snow shelter, like a snow cave, um, just with this idea that like, okay, well, half of our shelters are gone. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember Drew like very calmly, like just shoveling and like other people shoveling. Like, Thank you. And, um, and uh, but it is blowing so hard and there's so much deposition that, you know, again, all I remember is like within a few hours, we're like, we're, we can't even keep that thing open. Like mm -hmm. we just, like just retreat to the tent. So we had eight people in each of these two tents um, designed for four people. And so we're like <laughs> crammed in there in like, a, 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 you know, two it, little rows, essentially like, you know, knees to back kind of thing. Is um, everybody and, physically okay? Everybody's physically fine. Wow. Like that was the most remarkable thing is like, you know, people got turned over, thrown out, burnt, you know, yeah. things were burning and nobody, you know, nobody had any physical injury. And how, um, how about or, like key you know, equipment? You'll get to the equipment, I know, but like in terms of like people's mitts and things like that, did everybody 
Habits. I think at that point we had no idea, honestly. Okay. Like, like, you know, like just get people sheltered, like get right. everybody a hot drink, you know, get some food in people and like, let's like, we'll sort this out when we can. Okay. And, and I think part of that was just like, the weather was still like vicious, you right. know, in the sense that like, you so, really couldn't be out for an extended period of time um, right. and stay warm enough. And, and I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not skinny, but I like I have a hard time staying warm in in you know extended sure. circumstances like that. So, um, you know, we we were we were struggling. I think even like all of our you know six thousand meter jacket and everything else. Like I think we were all kind of struggling to just stay warm enough. Um, so we tuck into the night, and I remember the way that I remember this is we had an upper tent and a lower tent, and I think. The reason I remember that way is what the student, so the instructor tent became the upper tent and then the student tent, I think it had been pushed like down towards the edge of the perimeter in the storm event. Cause initially, you know, my recollection is that they were all kind of in a row, but then it became the upper tent and the lower tent. And um, so we, I was in the upper tent and it would be kind of mixed instructors and students at this point. Um, and I remember it's like midnight, the 4th of July and the lower tent breaks out in the star Spangled banner. <laughs> and I just remember like, Oh my God, you guys are amazing. You know, that like, we've just been through this like crazy experience that nobody, I mean, at this point, no, it's like, were we hit by an avalanche? Like we didn't mm. know what had happened. Um, in retrospect and like based on some weather reports we had after we came out of the field, um, the best thing we could figure out is it was actually like a micro burst that happens when wind collects and like comes, you know, basically there's some rock faces off to the, well, at the west side of where our camp was. And it probably just like the way it's like a little lily wall on the water where it just like the wind kind of picks up, collects itself and just hammers really quickly um, at like a hundred miles an hour, a hundred plus miles an hour. Um, and, th and then, you know, that little microburst was done. Um, we'd been hit with, you know, a fair bit of snow um, that had been, you know, sort of entrained by the microburst. Um, and then we were just back to like sort of normal storm conditions, <laughs> which were pretty hit hideous at this point. Um, so what, so what's everybody doing in the tent? Are you guys sitting back to back? Are you like lying on each other's laps? Are, are like, I can't, you know, eight people in a tent is, uh, is pretty tight and especially overnight. Yeah, I probably a little bit of both. Like, I, yeah. I think it was just like, just making get as comfortable, comfortable as you can, given the circumstances and people kind of in their layers, sleeping bags kind of draped on top, but nobody was like, lying down having a right. peaceful day. Are you worried about uh, like down sleeping bags getting wet with all like the condensation and melting of snow? It's probably not a concern we, at this point, but was we, that happening? We, yeah, <laughs> we probably should have been, but like we- yeah, It's not what you can do. They, they were, yeah, exactly. I mean, it was like, yes, that was happening. Most of us did have down bags. And yet, like, again, we were, I mean, at this point, honestly, we we're kind of just in survival. Like, yeah. how, how do we stay warm through this night? And then let's sort out, like, whatever we can sort out once, right. you know, once it gets light again. And, you know, as you know, it's 4th of July, summer in Alaska, like, it's light most of the time. But, you know, you have these few hours probably between 11 and 3 a.m. where it's pretty dusky and dark. So, mm -hmm. so we make it through that night, um, you know, 4th of July, dawn, storms getting worse and worse. We're out shoveling pretty much around the clock. So, so we're just tagging, you know, like some, someone goes out, shovels for a while, tap someone else, they go out, shovel for a while, you know, and goes on like that throughout the day and night. Um, and there's a few students in the mix who are, who are at this point, like they're shut down, you know, like, like you have to say like, I need you to take three sips of your water right now. I need you to put this candy bar in your mouth and chew it. I need, you know, like, and it just was that direct. And then there's a handful of students who were doing great. And then the instructor team was still doing pretty, pretty darn well. Um, so we're rotating through trying to keep our tents standing. <laughs> and, and it, but at, like, at some point on this 4th of July day, like we're losing, you know, it's just like, <laughs> we are not going to win this month. <laughs> um, and so I remember that night, like the upper tent had become just like, you know, a small little shell of a space that was essentially like a snow cave with a, a nylon interior. <laughs> um, and so at this point, we'd moved 13 people into the lower tent and there were three of us. It was myself and two of the students into the upper tent for the night. Um, and I, I like, I don't remember the decision making. If that was just organic, that people just realized like, okay, I just like, we're not going to fit in here. And we just, I don't know. But I remember like probably catching an hour or two of sleep, shivering, you know, just being like persistently hyperthermic. And uh, 
it was like dawn hit the morning of July 5th. And just, I just have this distinct memory of, you know, I had these two, two guys who are far older than I am. <laughs> I think I was 28 at the time and I was, you know, uh, and just looking like side to side and being like, I'm in charge. I have no idea what we're going to do oh, <laughs> and just being like, I don't know. And, uh, and, and, you know, feeling like I still had some reserve, but not a ton of reserve to help others. Like I was being yeah. able to dwindle in my own, like, all right, I got this, like, I can take care of myself, but like, I'm not sure how I'm going to take care of these like 12 individuals that I'm responsible for. Yeah. Um, and so I remember like getting, I love that your podcast is hot drinks because this is like so fundamental. Like I remember getting some hot drinks going right. and I think at this point they're like lukewarm drinks because it was like sure. too much trouble to try and like get the temperature up to an actual hot drink. Um, but, you know, getting a little bit of fluid in, a little bit of sweetness in and, uh, and crawling out of this like cave tent and seeing Marco Johnson, who is the course leader. And he's got, at this point, he's got this big beard and it's just like, he just looks like Yeti, you know, he's like what ice and snow and icicles and um right. he kind of crawls out of the lower tent and we just look at each other and I don't remember any words being exchanged but just like and knowing that we had to get out of there and whatever it looked like like we just had to leave and uh so we began that process and so we're what, like what, all right guys like what's the weather doing when up. you what's the weather doing when you wake Still up screaming I mean Still. like no change yeah like yeah. not we're just like in it uh. so. Yeah, so we're on day five of like big storm. Right, and so when, um, when did and, you like, first make a call? No, uh, oh, that's a good question. So we had our satellite phone, and I think after we got hit with that little microburst, uh, Marco called. Okay. And he said he's like, we just got hit by, and we at that point we really thought it was an avalanche, like the you know just the debris pile of an avalanche, something like that. But he's like, you know, we just had this event. We're down a bunch of gear. We're okay. We'll call, you know, we'll call back when we have, you know, when the storm breaks, whatever. But, you know, like at some point we're going to need some help. So the branch was aware. I don't know if you were at, at the farm. I think I point. was around at that time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember people scrambling. I, you know, I would love to hear that side of the story. Yeah. Like, my sense is like they were aware. They were on high alert. They packed a bunch of stuff. And then like we went totally MIA. Right. Um, so there was like one phone call probably um, on that July 3rd evening. Um, and then we were just in like survival. And so, um, so we began, so it's still ripping. There is no way in, under any other circumstances, I would have thought this is a good idea to move our camp at this point. Like it's not, not a smart move. Um, and you know, and the reason for that, right, is that you're just exposing people, you right. know, in so many ways, like the effort to, to get ready, to pack up, to put their harnesses on, to like get yeah. ropes up, like, and then be out there in this weather even though, you know, we were just going down, down, down. And, you know, we knew if we got to 15, we would, we would, you know, be in better shape. Um, I always think so, about those situations and think like, it's bad now, but let's not make it worse. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Like, exactly. Sometimes I think we just, trying to make it better can make it worse real quick. <laughs> right. And I think we just gotten to this point where it's like, it can't get any worse. You know, like we, mm -hmm. this is, we, we got to get out of here or people are going to die. Right. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I look back on this, like the next, whatever 10 hours that I'm about to tell you about and I and I chuckle because it, it, if you had been an outsider looking in like it truly was comical so we I mean I don't know how many hours it took us to, to pack up but we you know we in some form or fashion everybody had a backpack which was amazing oh. um people had some combination of boots so oh. all the instructors because our tent hadn't been like crushed all the instructors had our inner boots our outer boots our crampons and like by and large we had all of our stuff um, students had some combination of outer boots or inner boots or booties or whatever, but not everybody had like a full complement of oh, like, wow. mountaineering boots and crampons. Um, and then we'd lost two ropes. So we had only two ropes left. Um, we had, everybody had, remarkably had a harness. And I think that was like us wow. counting and like your harness has to go in that your back. It has to go in your back. It has to go in your back. Um, and, you know, and by and large, people had their clothing. Um, and at this point, we hadn't lost a sleeping bag yet. So everybody had a sleeping bag. And uh, and we had this one tent, right? So, like, the tent cave, we were just, like, it's done for. Oh, wow. And I remember, like, clearing out gear, packing it up, and then the thing just within, like, 10 minutes just um, and collapsing. So we get everybody on a rope. And, again, this is comical, right, because you've got eight people on a, you know, 50-meter rope. And you can, like, 
zero, you know, right. like they're right next to you. And, right. and, and normally you would have three or four on, on a rope exactly. like that. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, yeah. The, and the point being that if someone fell in a crevasse, it would just right. be one person and not three. And right. so, um, so if someone had fallen in a crack, I don't know what we would have right. done. This like, is now like the daycare not. line when the kids are holding the <laughs> string walking down the sidewalk. <laughs> But like, not sure wow. your harness is double back, but like whatever, we're going. Yeah. <laughs> so we begin our descent down the glacier, and you know, and there's a very real hazard, objective hazard of crevasses, and um, and and we begin our way down. Did and you, I just remember, like, did you wand the route going going up? Were you following wands going down? Did that help? probably like? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it's pretty straight forward okay. other than you know yes there's some big cracks between you know 17 and 15 um but there's been so much snow deposition too that like right. i Wouldn't don't know, you know we're better off or, or worse off um but uh i think i was at the end of the second rope and so i remember you know leaving and kind of looking around and there's, there's still this stuff everywhere like the collapsed wow. tents, the tent poles but you know i like i think i remember like walking past an inflight pad and just being like see ya oh well like <laughs> oh, LNT on this trip right now like yeah no definitely no we, lo- we left a significant trade um wow, that must have been a weird I, know, was it snowing yeah. and still raging when you were, were leaving oh, camp totally yeah 100 okay. percent. i think it had i think it had died down a little bit and my evidence for this is that um shortly after leaving that camp a c-130 so a big military mm-hmm. plane flew overhead and uh and I, and for I you. remember, yeah. So they, we they, they weren't just out know. on a training mission. They'd got a call. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I think it was the only thing that could fly at this point, right? right. Like no small plane could fly. So they needed something big. So Knowles, I think had called us, you know, Fairbanks and said, Hey, <laughs> we've got this missing 16 people. Any chance we could do a flyover? And Marco was, I think, leading the first rope team. So I was like anchoring and Marco was out front and he had the ground air radio. Okay. Why, why did we call back? After, like, cause I there, there was a time you, know, you made that initial call and then they didn't hear anything. There was no specific reason. That, like in the debrief, I think that, you know, what, what we all concluded is that honestly, we were not firing on all cylinders, right? Sure. Like okay. we were in survival yeah. Yeah. thinking only about like the next moment. And I, I, you know, like I have some recollection of like saying, Hey, Marco, should we call, you know? And, but I think again, like our, our capacity for functioning was so low at that mm-hmm. point. And you didn't want to bother either. them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, at that point, there's nothing anybody could do. But right. it certainly would have been a nice courtesy to be like, we're still alive. Like, yeah. we're doing it. Like, we're, we're functioning in. barely, you know. we're. Um, so, and even just giving an update. Like, yeah, storm's still raging. Like, here's our situation. We've got one tent. We're, you know, right. but everybody's, you know, everybody's okay. okay. So it wasn't like um, the, the sat phone got wet or it wasn't a, an issue like that? Okay. I don't remember any of that, but, okay. um, and I remember like in the debrief, you know, Marco just saying like, yeah, we were just in survival and like, we didn't think there was anything anybody could do. And so like, we just were in it. Right. Um, but anyway, the C-130 flies over and I'm in the back and I can't communicate with the front really. And I don't know, maybe I was so out of it that I didn't even consider it. But um, I think I made this assumption that whoever had the ground air radio had pulled it out <laughs> to try and make a communication with this plane flying overhead. Um, and, uh, but sure enough, that wasn't the case. And like, they hadn't tried, I think, I think Marco had the radio and he had it on, but didn't try and communicate. And apparently the C-130 didn't try to communicate either, or they weren't on the same channel or I don't know what happened, but anyway, this thing circled a couple of times. And they could, they couldn't see you, I assume. Well, apparently they could. Oh, okay. And what they reported back to Knowles is we saw uh, 15 people. <laughs> <laughs> like surrounding a crevasse. So I don't know how they came up with that because, you know, my recollection is we were kind of in two lines stretched out. Um, but so they reported back like 15 people, maybe around a crevasse. And, you know, that was like the information that made it back to the branch. So now the branch is like, great. They've like one person's dead <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> in a crevasse, like, you know. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm sure what was happening at the branch was quite terrifying. Um, and so we make our way down and, you know, sort of miraculously enough, we make it back to our 15 camp and there's still the remnants of our wall down there and probably we'd left a little cache of gear or whatnot. We set up our one tent, our one four person tent, <laughs> and we proceed to all 16 of us get into that tent and spend the night in a four person tent. Spent the night. Um, spent the night. Yeah. Because it was so, I mean, it was still like way too brutal to try and like busy outside and, wow. uh, I don't think any of us had like the energy to try and build a snow shelter. 
so uh so we hunker in this one tent and my one recollection of that night is like I was finally warm like that was mm-hmm. the first time in five whatever maybe only three days but that I was actually like warm and I remember like passing around this like Nalgene bottle of like bean slurpy <laughs> lukewarm whatever um and you know again just kind of making it through the night and uh and so then so this is like July 6th um the morning of July 7th we, you guys got to be uh, really tired at this point because you exactly. didn't get any sleep the like, night before now you only got a couple hours with 16 people in the tent probably didn't get any of it yeah, we're working on like three ish nights of very little sleep, very little like hydration, food, you know. I mean, we did, we'd given up on cooking really. So it was just like whatever snack foods we had and enough to like make water, you know, but not good, right. anything nourishing. So, uh, so July 7th dawns Bluebird. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, finally. Um, except for it's still like it's still screaming so it's the wind's still blowing but it's at least the, the skies have cleared the snow has stopped um we start getting out our gear and like staking it out and trying to dry stuff out and this is where we actually did lose a sleeping bag so someone like you know got their sleeping bag out and like poof off, off it went into the wind into a crevasse or down the harbor glacier or something um but we got ourselves sort of relatively dried out and a little bit sorted out and it, it said the seventh as my recollection is the day that we finally did actually make contact with the branch and the park service and said you know here's our here's our situation we're all alive um we're in rush shades and like we've lost three tents two ropes <laughs> five pairs of crampons <laughs> some plastic boots and you know we're going to need some support to get off the mountain um and uh and you know everybody was grateful we were all alive and uh, they were like great we will come in um so the park service has this fancy stripped down helicopter that they fly at high altitude called the denali llama and so they're like when we can get the llama in we'll bring your gear in and like you know go from there um and i don't like again i don't remember how this decision was made like at this point we're beginning to like take inventory of not just the gear we've lost but also like injuries and you know people like are, like are we really able to walk off the mountain right. and um you know Knowles has this really clear kind of um culture or uh, you know if you can do it do it you know right. like it's like there's a, a really clear culture of like autonomy and self-efficacy and I've always appreciated that about Knowles. And um, I think Marco being a longtime Knowles director was like super committed. Like we are walking off this mountain together as a team. Um, and so, you know, so I, you know, that, that was like, I don't know that there was even an option if anybody had been like, I would like to fly off with the Dalai Lama. Right. Um, so I think it was not until the next day that uh, the wind died down enough and the helicopter came in and, you know, there was probably this moment and it was bluebird and it was evening and this moment of all of us just like, okay, like we're, we're going to be okay. And uh, they dropped off all the gear and chocolate and goodness. Um, but I remember having this secondary moment, which is like <laughs> the llama takes off and I'm right. like, so here we are at 15,000 feet (laughs) and we've got this epic journey to get like down to this mountain um and you know and we you know later learned that i think collectively among 16 people had lost over like 350 pounds of body weight we were like a haggard crew (laughs) um and so you know but you still had another like week long journey out totally (laughs) and not like a simple one you know Mm. we have this like crevasses to navigate and big rivers to navigate and enormous packs to carry and um but you know again my recollection of this group of individuals was I mean there was certainly like some PTSD happening in the group you know there were a few individuals who were pretty darn shut down at this point um but that people you know we at that point when we had this like replenishing of supplies sitting down for the debrief and um, I remember some of the younger students, you know, in their 20s. Um, and this was an all-male group outside of one female who was 19 years old. 19. Um, she's, yeah, she's now actually an Alaska bush pilot. She was an Alaska native and uh, went. Oh, she was a guide for a long time on the Nolly, and now she's a bush pilot. She's awesome. Um, and she actually was the seller throughout the thing. But, um, but it was a lot of, you know, guys in their 20s, and they were like, yeah, that was awesome. And, you know. And then this older guy and his, you know, probably in his forties who had kids at home and whose who son's birthday had been like through sometime in the storm event. And, you know, I remember him piping up and just being like, well, I was thinking about my son and, you know, what my wife might've gotten him for his birthday and thinking I just might not ever see him again. And, 
and I think that like I just remember the tone changing and people mm. really settling into this idea like oh yeah like that was that was a pretty close call like we really we really sort of snuck out by the skin of our teeth and um so there was a lot of processing as we made our way down the mountain um and you know and a lot of singing and a lot of just like all right, like this, we're still in it, you know, right. like we're not, we're not home free until we step foot on that bus. Um, and there, you know, there's, as you know, this like, uh, what is the saying of, uh, it's not over until the bus rolls off or whatever. In Alaska, um, we always say it's not back until, until you're back at the branch playing ping pong. Right. Fair enough. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> And I just, you know, so I just remember like that being a huge role of the instructors of like, we're not done yet. You know, like you still have to be on your game. You had a big river to cross. And, and, yeah. And, you know, big packs and crevasse terrain and steep right. terrain and, you know, thorax falling on you. And so, um, but anyway, the way out was relatively uh, uneventful. Um, and, and again, I think the river crossing was, was pretty uneventful as well. And so, um, yeah, an epic seven days at altitude, and then uh, out we went, and uh, for shells of our former self. <laughs> and uh, I just, yeah, I mean, I think I was like, you know, fifteen pounds lighter or something. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty crazy. Um, and I, and I also remember, I mean, one of the, one of the, yeah, I know you talked on your podcast a lot about the Knowles, one of the Knowles leadership traits of tolerance for adversity and uncertainty, and. I mean, I feel like that's what kept showing up for me is just like, we're just in it. You just do it. You just dig in. You lean into the, the adversity. You lean into the uncertainty. Um, and it really wasn't actually until I'd flown home. And at this point, I was living in Los Angeles and was like, that's when I finally like lost it. Like all really? the debriefing, all not the like, then. not until then. It wasn't until I'd like completely left, you know, five days later or whatever. And just was like, whoa, <laughs> that was, that was real. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's Denali 2002. Wow. So what was it like, you know, there had to have been moments though before Los Angeles that you'd like, was it when the bus showed up that you're like, take a deep breath? <clears throat> Excuse me. Was it when you got back to the branch and saw friends and started giving hugs? Like that must have been some kind of emotion going on then. I, you know, I'm sure there was. Like, yeah. I'm sure there was like a series of steps of just like, you know, I remember Tim Phelps was there. Mm -hmm. our um, program supervisor and you know the debrief with Tim and then a debrief with Drew Lehman as risk management right. and a debrief with you know the branch or Don Floor the branch director and, you know a series of debriefs um but I also remember not like I don't know that there was so much that was left unsaid or so much that was sort of left unprocessed which mm -hmm. I think is you know the natural order of things when you go through something that's, that's kind of significant and you you know you just there's just a natural unfolding that happens of, of, you know, making sense of it or, or, you know, feeling, feeling the feeling, you know, versus just like, I got to just keep showing up and taking care of, of my people. Right. Um, so, yeah. Did you have any other contracts, but you know, that you were planning to work that summer up there or anywhere else? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, okay. I remember going home, you know, yeah, in right short after. order and like, I think I, you know, starting school or something like that. Right. So I think that was just it for that. And, um, but I do remember, you know, coming home, my mom going, so you're never going to do that again, right? I was like, nah, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about what that, that experience was coming home was like, because, you know, who were you living with? Who did you get to talk to? Who did you, you know, talk it out with? Um, what was yeah. that, that experience? Because, you know, I've had similar experiences for for incidents and and it's hard coming back. It is. And I, you know, this is so, so I was actually dating a guy at the time who worked for public radio and I had, uh, I had, his name was John. Um, and he, I mean, he was amazing. Like he was amazing. We were living together and he was like an amazing, just like gentle cushion of, of return. He knew nothing about this world. You know, he was right. not an old person. He, knew, he was not an outdoor educator. Like it was, which in some ways I think was better. Like, cause he was just able to just like, take it in and, you know, be the central landing place for me. Um, but my one, my one huge regret is because he was working for public radio, um, he, which is why I was living in LA. I don't, you know, that's a weird chapter in my life. Um, but I had actually taken a bunch of recording equipment with me and mm -hmm. I had like with this idea of doing some sort of cool radio, mm, you know, show it, you know, yeah. Um, and I, and I had like leading up into the storm and even into the beginning of the storm, a ton of audio. Oh. Um, and those tapes may still exist somewhere, but I think I was like, so, I mean, I don't know, like that whole project just like went out the window for me. And I, you know, it's, 
it, I regret that because I think I, I think I couldn't face it in like in retrospect. And I think also I just got busy and I started mm-hmm. school and I just okay. didn't create the time or bandwidth for it. But um, but I wonder if John still has those tastes and like mm-hmm. <laughs> what actually might be on them. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> if I can uncover them. <laughs> yeah. The next course you worked after that, because you know I've, I had an incident and then I haven't shared on the podcast yet, but I will, and I, it's in my book about uh, an incident in India and. I remember my next course after that, it was a sea kayaking course on, on the BC coast, which is a very challenging area to take sea kayak of novice sea kayakers. Um, and that's another story. But I, I remember I had a heightened sense of awareness as a, as a course leader on that trip. And I mean, my risk management, um, I guess my line was probably a little lower than it usually is. Yeah. You know, what was your, do you remember your next course? Maybe was it a year later or, or some time later? Did, did you, um, were you yourself or do you think you were a bit more um, heightened? You know, I don't remember what my next course was. I, yeah. I think it probably was the next summer, 2003, but okay. and I'm, I'm sure it was in Alaska. Yeah. Um, and it was probably not near. Nice. <laughs> and, but, and I don't remember being like, I think that honestly, I walked away from that trusting my instincts more and trusting, like trusting that when you're, when you're faced with that uncertainty and, and adversity, like you just, you just tap in, like you mm-hmm. tap into what you know how to do Absolutely. and that kind of innate, innate wisdom that, you know, it's partly built from experience and partly mm-hmm. built from just like, I don't know, like I'm it's making it up, you know, like, there's, <laughs> yeah, like there is no instruction manual for this situation. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I think that that's what it actually prompted me to do versus, you know, like the, uh, the alternative maybe is like tighten up and try and control it. And I think like, I mean, it's, this is probably, you know, a decade of mountaineering in Alaska that I just realized like you can't control it, right? Yeah. Like so you just have to meet it however it comes to you and and do your best to you know manage it finesse it you know make sense of it whatever um and keep as close as you can you know in that in whatever shows up yeah um i mean it, it does lead to another story which is yeah. that uh that was 2002 in 2004 i decided to take another general light contract all right I, I um, heard, i'm just gonna pause you there how, how are yeah. you doing for time because i i can keep going um i, I know uh, we generally have an hour, but I want to, I'm happy to keep going. I've got time. Okay. But I don't want to like, you can cut out. Whatever. No, 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 no. This is good. This is great. And we, we can make it a two-parter even. <laughs> don't do that. Um, sorry. I talked, I talked too long, but no, uh, no, this, so, this is a big story. So, you, so you're good to keep going. I'm going to keep going, okay. but I'll make this one relatively short because that's all right. It's not that it's not that interesting, but I think it's a nice, like it's, it's answer to your question, although it was two summers later that, yeah. you know, you I don't know if I reached out and said, Hey, I'd love to work another Denali course or if Noel reached out to me, I think it was Noel reached out to me. We're like, Hey, we're looking for a course leader. And, and, uh, you know, for your non nose audience, right. The course leader is who's ultimately holding, you know, holding the course and is ultimately responsible for what happens. Um, and in this first, the 2002, Marco was the course leader. I was, you know, kind of second in terms of my experience and my you know, support of the course. Um, and uh, so they asked me to be the course leader, right? So I'm like, oh boy, you know, this is like, this is a big ask to course lead Denali. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and in contrast, so I, but I said yes, and I showed up and uh, I was working uh, with uh, Sean Benjamin, who was a dear oh. friend and uh, Brad Patel, who I didn't know quite as well, um, but, you know, a really experienced instructor team, which was great. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, as a course leader, was in love with like, okay, great. Like everybody knows what they're doing. And my job is just to coordinate and finesse things. Right. Anyway, this course was epic in a totally different way and that we couldn't even get across the river. So it had been right. a super this. big snow year, hot, hot, early spring. Yeah. And things were just raging. <laughs> before before you go before you go on, yeah. what were, what were your parents thinking at this point? You oh know, my god, they have given up. <laughs> did they they'd given up? Yeah, I think all, I think all of our parents had given up by the time we signed up for Knowles. But uh, did did they did they have a a realization of kind of what you went through and how dangerous it was, how dangerous it was, and and kind of the risks in, in that incident with on Denali your first time, or were they just kind of like you're doing your thing? They were probably somewhere in between like yeah, okay. oh that that sounds scary you know right. but not probably not fully so like the next time you're like I'm, I'm hey mom dad i'm going back to denali they weren't like no you cannot go no i mean not, not that they were you know you're, yeah you're i mean i think they'd always be like yeah we'd really rather you didn't but like right. we get you like we understand you're gonna do what you're gonna do and we'll okay for you so yeah that's All great right. great and i my mom was probably shaking her fist as we speak um 
All right, but, so you get uh, off the bus because, and the river's big. Did you know the river was like, big going uh, into we it? Did. We okay. didn't know that like water levels were high, that it was going to be a challenge. And so we get off the bus and you look at the river and I just like shook my head. I was like, there is no way, like, uh-uh, no way not happening. Um, and we, and you know, and this is partly based on like having been a ranger there and crossed mm. this river, I mean, tens of times. Wow. Um, and it's always a challenge, even when it's low, but I, you know, I, was like, I just don't like, I just don't see this happening. But I think we like, you know, gave it our best effort and, you know, like tried to test it out a few braids and spent a day or two. And um, there had been a precedent of an old course taking a raft across the, mm. the um, McKinley River. And so I remember calling and like, Raft? Like, <laughs> what are we gonna do here? Um, d- d- don't like, you know? It's easy to laugh off a river crossing when you're thinking about Denali and all the hazards that come when you're up on the glacier and the storms and that. But you know, for most wilderness knolls courses, like river crossings are one of the most dangerous things we do. Absolutely, and I'd say like generally crossing, you know, any big Alaska river is, yeah. is a huge hazard. And I think sometimes we we get normalized to it and we kind of like take it for granted, like, oh, we're just going to cross this thing and people rush into it. Um, right. I think the beauty of the McKinley is like, it's such a known hazard because it's mm-hmm. so big and it's such, you know, that people, everybody takes their time, they scout it, they, you know, like, like right. they do it properly typically. So anyway, I remember us scouting and just being like, uh-uh, not happening. Calling Knowles, no raft. Okay, you're on your own, figure it out. And the other option is actually to take the bus back down the road to the IELTS Visitor Center and you extend your hike by a fair number of miles, but then you actually hop onto the toe of the glacier versus like the river that comes out. And the glacier kind of does this like funny curve at the end. So anyway, you hop over and you basically then begin hiking up the toe of the Muldrow Glacier all the way to where the cache site is. Hmm. So that's what we did. Um, And uh, yeah, and, uh, and it, you know, again, it extended, like, I think usually you're at the cache by day three, we weren't at the cache until like day seven. (laughs) Oh, wow. And yeah. (laughs) So we had an evac in that time, someone had twisted their ankle and, you know, like we weren't super, you know, we had four days of food or something to get us to the cache. So we were (laughs) eking out our ration. We get to the cache and, you know, everything's melted out and uh, we begin to sort of like work our way, you know, again, we're on this picking time frame of like, okay, now we've got like three weeks, we got to get up this thing. So we're like trying to move as fast as we can. The glacier's like bare, you know, and usually you have a pretty good amount of snow cover. And so (laughs) I remember we're like, trying to bury our you know we'd, we'd carry, carry our food up we try and like bury it and the ravens would just destroy it and so like all of our snack food has been eaten by ravens and you know stuff's melting out left right and center so you know some of our food is like you know water <laughs> water logs which you know just doesn't happen on you know yeah. a big uh alaska mountain typically in june um and so like, you know, we're just having trial after trial, right? But we're like making the most of it and um, moving slowly our way up. And then, and then like we get, I don't know, we're probably at 8,000 feet and people just start falling in crevasses left. <laughs> falling in crevasses. <laughs> yeah. And so, so we're like hauling people out of crevasses and, um, and just like shaking so, our heads, like, what are we doing? <laughs> what, what's it like uh, on the glacier at this point? Is it, is it below fern line or is there snow? Is there snow bridges? Like, why there's are people snow, falling in? There's snow, but the snow bridges are weak. And so where, you know, where you think it would have a snow bridge that was good and like half the course might get over it. And then the last, you know, heavier person pops in and, um, and we haven't had any like big falls that you know okay. people are just popping in like so it's like your hit, leg but... one leg is going in or one to your knee or your ankle or exactly but oh, it's okay. happening all the time like right. <laughs> like <laughs> like every hour we're like ah zero you know like, wow out. um so people aren't and, disappearing uh, in in crevasses at this point. no Not until <laughs> okay. um so we're I, you know somewhere between eight and ten thousand feet and uh and one of our teams just goes for a huge banger and just wow. all the way in like you know slingshotting into the crevasse and this, and so we pull them out in pretty short order. And it's, you know, it's relatively easy to get someone out of a craft when you've got a big team because you can just take another rope team and pull them out. And um, and he comes out and he's got a dislocated shoulder. Yeah. So, um, first time dislocation, we're able to pop it. Brad was masterful. He like popped it right back in, felt okay, no other injuries. I'm like, all right, we're like, we've just got to press pause. Like, what are we doing? we make camp and we, you know, have this whole conversation and we call in and we're like, so we've got this first time dislocation, you know, like by protocol, that's an automatic evac. 
but like you know we're behind and we got like i don't know we're gonna put the um, whole course at risk <laughs> right just walking through crevasses uh, to get them out and so it's, again this is my recollection but i think they gave us the thumbs up to like proceed right like okay like we're gonna make an exception to this like he's okay he's got good circulation just watch it and like carry on like, okay, you know, like if we get to get to 10,000 feet, conditions are going to improve, you know, and we'll deal with trying to make it through this mess on our way down, on our way down. <laughs> um, you know, you've got a fair bit of pressure on you, right? Like people pay mm. a lot of money for this course and like to not make it to 10,000 feet. It's like, right. geez. Can you um, imagine if you were guiding and we're like, I have tips I based know. on this? <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, guiding it is just, pull you out. it's a different ballgame. <laughs> So anyway, long story short, you know, a couple couple nights later, so we're trying to make our way up. A couple nights later, he rolls over in his lead bag and pops his shoulder out again. So uh-huh. it dislocates again. And we're like, oh. so we call in again. And we're like, okay, like we've got to get him out. Like it's not stable. And, uh, and you know, pops right back in. He's fine. He doesn't feel poorly, but like this is just going to keep happening. Right. And so um, they, for whatever reason, I think there's been another epic uh, evac um, somewhere. I don't know, somewhere whatever I don't remember the circumstances of it but they used up a ton of the evac budget and the resources for evacs in this epic evac somewhere a couple weeks prior and they're like we got nothing for you and I was like oh we're in trouble I was like well we've got to get this guy off the mountain but um you know to get him out out means hiking all the way down like presumably the McKinley's still not possible right we've got to get him out out all the way off the toe of the glacier And, you know, that means like, we're going to have to send, you know, one instructor and we're going to have to like tell two students that like they can't, they're done. Like, it's strange that they would have a, you know, I understand they have an evac budget, but this, this comes back on insurance and eventually, you know, the students insurance, but that's a whole nother ball game. I know, but like there were no resources. Yeah. That's really really frustrating when you're in the field (laughs) and you're, you're not getting the support from the branch when, you know. You're, yeah, you're and I don't fault anybody. Challenging. Like I, you know, I'm sure whatever the circumstances were, they were doing their best, and yeah. you know, but you know, really, what we we're asking is like, we can get these, you know, we can get an instructor and the student down to the to the cash site. Could you send in a couple, you know, ultimately three people because it's bear country to like come meet them and like hike them out. Like that would we can make the rest of the course happen if you can make that happen, and like they couldn't make that happen. So, so the plan we actually ended on is like, we were going to hike these two back down. Like, so Brad graciously, I don't know if he volunteered or I coursed him or bribed him or something. Yeah. was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And uh, he volunteered to basically go down to the, to the cash site and camp with the students kind of indefinitely as we tried to like make our way back, you know, to, to the top of Denali. Um, and uh, so, but I mean, it was like, you know, again, from this like, leadership and decision making perspective I just remember feeling like so pulled of like okay I've got these 11 other students or now 10 other students because one had already been evac 10 students who you know really want to go they're fit they're making it they're doing everything they need to do we've got this one injured student ah um Mm. so anyway we got we got Brad and the student settled. Sean and I proceeded with the rest of the group. And sure enough, once we got over 10,000, things were crewed there. Like we were able to hike up Carson's, get onto the Harper. But we'd, we'd now at this point, after all, you know, this evac and then getting this guy down and um, we had a one day summit window. <laughs> so we like got ourselves up to 17.3 and, uh, and people were pretty tired because we'd been push, 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 pushing and people were tired and not, not super acclimatized. And so, um, we had this one day summit window and and kind of fortunately we woke up like we had just gotten up to our high camp and really we had like we had to get alpine start the next morning and go if we were going to go and um somewhat fortunately like it was not a go day so we were Uh like bummer you know but again from this like course leader leadership perspective like because there's actually no way we (laughs) we would have summit right and and you don't have to be the one to make the call (laughs) Exactly. I'm like, thank you, weather. Right. <laughs> thank you, weather gods. <laughs> um, so anyway, we, we you know, spun and, and made our way back down the mountain. And I don't even remember, like, getting through that horrible crate. I mean, I remember Sean went into a crevasse over her head and, wow. you know, still more crevasse falls, but we somehow made our way down. And then, you know, and then poor Brad has been camping for two weeks, essentially, with this, you know, student oh, with his man. dislocated shoulder. Um, but uh, but getting devoured yeah, by mosquitoes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't think they were that bad on that right. side of the, okay. the path. So yeah. uh, hopefully, yeah. but I think yeah. it was pretty, it was, it was a very gracious offer, right. um, whether willingly or not, but, but Brad and the student made to like allow the rest of the students to try and give it a go. Wow. But, yeah. That's uh, crazy. Yeah. And then I went back again in 2007. Yes. Let's finish this and, off uh, with a good, with a good no, note. No, no, no. I mean, only to say like, yes, I went back again. Finally, 2007, we summited every, got every student up to the top and, uh, and then went back again as a guide uh, with Alzheimer's in 2010 on the West Side and got everybody up. So, so I finally, finally made it to the top. <laughs> yeah. So when you went back in 2010, you, there, there's obviously stories from every trip, but anything stick out for you from that trip? Other, no, other than, you know, it was West Butteris that was guided and it was so not my oh, style. So know, sorry, like the, the time you summited with Knowles. Knowles. Um, no, I mean, I think it was just one of those, like, I was course leading, things went well, it was smooth, you know, yeah. great. You know, there was, it was like the way you imagine a course should go. And, right. you know, I think there was a few moments of, you know, sort of, uh, are we really going to get everybody to the top and, you know, decision making amongst the instructors of like, how, you know, how are we doing this? But, you know, no, it was great. And it, you know. And you did get everybody up? I think so. Oh, wow. you know what? I think we might have had to spin. I know I got my team up and that, you know, we basically, it was Patrick Met Mettenbrink. I think Patrick might've had to spend his like short of the summit and, mm. and come back down. I can't remember. Right. Wow. And yeah. just before we end, tell me a little bit about that, the guiding experience going up there. Obviously it's totally different than a Knowles course when you're guiding with a professional mountain guiding company and you have clients that, you know, aren't necessarily there for the skills, um, there for more for the experience and the pictures, um, yeah. and whatnot. <laughs> How is that experience for you compared to working in a Knowles course? Um, you know, I mean, I just, I, I gave it a, like, I did some guiding on Rainier, like when I was kind of at the end of my Knowles career and I was like, oh, I don't need to be out for, you know, right. 30 to 75, 95 days. Um, so I did some guiding on Rainier and Baker close to home. And then uh, it was AJ actually who said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, this trip for Alpine Ascent. Would you do it with me? And mm. I was like, I'll do anything with you, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, it just sounded like, it was like this great opportunity. And right. Like, yes. Like, let's do this together. It'll be super fun to guide together. And, uh, and I think, I mean, you know, the take home was like, yeah, no, I'm not like, I'm not cut from guide fabric. Mm. Like I am very much an educator and yeah, it, it gave me so much appreciation for those and what we mm. do and the students, you know, that come there to learn, like, just as you said, like they come here to learn the skills and you can, you know, you can sort of help them see their own self-efficacy and like pull out of them their own sort of internal wisdom and their own, you know, just confidence and competence and um you know guiding is like yeah like people are in it to say they got to the summit of Denali and not you know not 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 to diminish people's motivations to go on a guided trip but yeah, you know me. the majority are really there to like get to the summit and have bragging rights and don't necessarily have an interest in like doing the hard work that it mm -hmm. takes to um to get there and um you know so we had a fine time I do remember yeah. we got all our clients to the top and I remember coming back to I came up with AJ and, and we just kind of looked into them. We're good. Like this is, this is good. And that was, right. that was the last. And it must've been easier working with, with AJ instead of, you know, a, a, a veteran kind of guide that uh, has been working in the guiding realm. Like I'm sure you kind of ran it like a mini Knowles course anyway, because that's what yeah. you're familiar with. <laughs> yeah. And that was the, is the outside of science. And there were so many instructors, Knowles instructors who were kind of, you know, either right. double dipping or like had, you know, started a guide sure. for Alpine. So, you know, there was a lot of Knowles, yeah. Knowles like, stuff happening and yeah. and yeah absolutely like to work with someone else who understands the ethic and the ethos and the mm -hmm. you know and, and also just appreciates like even though you're guiding and your objective is to get people to the top like you're just still just appreciating the place and the beauty and the right you know the magic of it all um along the way which was which was is always really important to me so yeah Absolutely. Wow. Uh, I love these kind of themed stories that we've been having. Um, we've been having Andy Blair with his Kenya stories and and, and now this uh, Denali focused pod. I, I, I really like it. It uh, it's allows us to dive deep into a kind of a course area and, and a couple of obviously epic experiences. All right. Well, let, let's finish it off with our rapid fire questions that we'd like to ask all guests. Um, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Well, maybe uh, this is an easy answer. I don't know, based on the the stories you've told, but what is your favorite location to lead expeditions or what was? Yeah, it is an easy. I mean, the Ala like Alaska mountaineering is absolutely favorite, although close, close second. And I've been like 
really hankering for the Slate of the Canyons. I really, yeah. <clears throat> just some really spectacular and uh, magical moments in the canyons. Um, and then I'll give it a third place to the Pacific Northwest, which is like my home, home stomping ground. But I, I think again, there's just something really cool about uh, the mountains in the Pacific Northwest and the combination of like big trees and rock and snow. And it's not quite as majestic as, um, as Alaska, but um, there's a lot of, a lot of cool adventures in the Northwest. Yeah, for sure. All right. What's your favorite piece of gear goes on all trips? Um, so or this, a bunch is, of trips? this is very, very unique. Okay. Um, I actually, so early in my nose career, I started having a ton of like uh, cervical spine pain, like to the point that it was really hard for me to carry a pack. So oh, no. um, old time nose instructor Dan Pozell was like, make yourself a tump line. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. So I had spent like six months living in Nepal when I was in college and, I, you know, sure enough, everybody, you know, in Nepal, India, in the Himalaya uses tump lines to carry their stuff. And, yeah, just describe um, a tump, so I, tump line for those folks who don't know. So, so it basically has like, well, I made mine out of like a, a two, three inch piece of like flat webbing on top. And then I just sewed uh, like a one inch piece of webbing around it with a little um, strap. So it basically like held the bottom of my backpack and then came around my forehead. Um, and so I started using this on all of my courses and I, you know, I just like, I, I'd have my like, you know, hip belt on and my shoulders are like vaguely around my shoulders, but, um, but most of the weight actually was on the pump line and it totally wow. saved my nose career. Yeah. Like I couldn't, it, it, for whatever reason, it sort of like realigned my cervical yeah. spine so that I wasn't, wasn't in That's pain. That's incredible. And was able to start yeah. So the, but the only scary part was like, I do it sometimes when I was mountaineering and I'm like, if I fall on a crap, I am, <laughs> I am done for. I'm going to like snap my spine. Yeah. <laughs> But wow. that never happened, so. <laughs> I'm surprised that didn't uh, take off and they, they probably weren't, they weren't selling it at the Rocky Mountain Branch or something <laughs> next summer. I, don't, I think people look at me and like, why would you ever do that? You know, right. That was terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Having, having spine <laughs> issues is not a good thing for a backpacking or mountaineering instructor. <laughs> No, but what backpacking or mountaineering instructor doesn't have right. them is my question. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> At some point. <laughs> Eventually. All right. What's your, what's the best backcountry costume that you've seen or that you've worn oh. yourself? Yeah, I'm not a costume person. So, um, no, I'm really not. I, uh, so I don't even have a good answer. I would say like er Erica Linnell, Aj's wife, uh, mm. she, she is a costume queen. And I think that she and I worked the Alaska Wilderness Course together. And I, my only recollection, I don't really remember any of them. I just remember like every other day, she's like pulling some other like wig or like skirt or scarf. <laughs> and I was like, what, like, where is this all coming from? <laughs> so. I'll, I'll defer to the other Erica. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get her on and, and she'll make it up for, uh, we'll have to ask yeah. her twice for that. No yeah. problem. All right. What, what image comes to mind when you hear the word adventure? Um, I, I know a lot of your guests have said this, but I think just like the unknown and just being willing mm -hmm. to, to dive into it and to lean into it. And um, I remember I worked at a course in Patagonia where, where the maps weren't even complete. Like we just had this big white expanse on the map where, you know, the day that they'd done the photography or the, you know, the, the map and the GIS, whatever, like it was cloudy. So there was just a big white spot. And, and I was like, I remember looking at the maps and like, so like, this is where we're going. Like we're, we're going into the white. <laughs> um, and I had no idea what that train looked like. Like nobody had been there, nobody had scouted it. And uh, so, yeah. So I think like, just like you the know. willingness to just like, give it a go and know that it's all going to work out and whether that means you're tucking your tail and turning around or, you know, you're seeing some of the most spectacular territory in the world. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's adventure. Awesome. All right. Last one. What is any locate? What is the one location you'd love to go back to and share a hot drink with some friends that you've been to before? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's been 10 years since I've been back in Alaska and I think I, um, just like the canyons are calling me, I think mm. going back into the park, um, doesn't have to be into, you know, to Denali per se, but, um, there's a lot of really special spots like on the rivers there and just mm. in the park itself. And, um, you know, so many great memories of like dawn or dusk and watching a grizzly bear just wander on by with, you know, a wolf off mm. in the distance or whatever. Um, and yeah, just being able to sit and, and share a hot drink there sounds pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. It is a special place. I'm sure you'll get your family back up there. As, Hope so. As I will someday. Yeah. Yeah. I look forward to adventures. Our kids are in the same age, but uh, yeah. a little older. I'm sure we'll, yeah. we'll get into lots of crazy adventures. Awesome. Well, this has been a real treat. I have really appreciated you coming on the show and, and sharing those stories. I know it's uh, it's hard to tap into that emotional space to share some of these you know, life impacting stories. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you, you did a fantastic job. I really appreciate it. 
thanks. Well, it's been so fun to, to listen to your podcast and to be a part of the project. And uh, yeah, no, really fun. It's also, it's also prompted me just to think about, mm. you know, my time at Knowles and my dear friends. And so um, I'm so grateful for all the work you've put into this. So awesome. thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it. Do you tell your daughter some of these stories? Do you do story time? Uh, you know, I, ha- I haven't really, I think I don't consider myself a great storyteller, but, um, <gasps> but I probably should. And yeah. so, you know, I don't know if she'd appreciate them or not. I think we're just like, uh, ah, whatever. That, that, you know, that, <laughs> do, you t- do you, do you tell that, them to your kids? Yeah. That's what prompted me yeah. really. One of the, one of the big things that prompted me to start this podcast was, you know, I've got three girls and, and the older two that are nine and seven. And the last two years, two or three years, we've gotten into like story time with dad at bedtime. And right. instead of reading a book, I, I tell them a story. And then right. like, you know, after a hundred or so stories, they're like, okay, dad, story time. I'm like, I need night up. Like, I don't have, I don't have anything. They're like, just make it up. I'm like, I, I, don't, I can't, I, I don't have anything tonight. But so I, so I needed to collect some more stories from my fellow instructors right. <laughs> to, to share with them. And, and I have been some sharing some of them, but yeah, you should look like, at nighttime. They, they, she'd love it. That's, that's good. That's good inspiration. I mean, I will say too, that I think one thing I've been super aware of right now. So, you know, I now work in the ICU and with COVID, right. it's been a tough a tough year and like that all of these lessons, like all of these stories and experiences, stories that come from the experiences. I mean, like it's all just fuels this capacity in me to like roll with things, you know? And so even as like things have been blowing up in the ICU and we have no idea how to treat COVID patients and we, you know, like obviously we've learned a lot, but like just this capacity to like sit and be with something that's uncomfortable Mm -hmm. um, is an enormous gift that I have gotten from Noel. And Absolutely. so, you know, like, I guess that's what I try to impart to my daughter. It's like, yeah. you, can, you can be okay, even right. if you don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I won't keep you any longer. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, thank you. I'll definitely let you know when, when this goes up and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll talk Sounds soon good. and I'd love to get down to Whitefish and, and, and meet your family and, and meet you in person. Well, you and all of your family are totally welcome anytime. And yeah. some, my dream is to actually go up into Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. So yeah. maybe, maybe you can give me some tips. And- <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, wife's from Calgary. So um, they head down to Whitefish and her brother a oh, bunch. Nice. And, and there's oh, a yeah. chance Come we, us. we might end up back in Calgary someday. She wants to get back there so bad. Great. Yeah, no, we'd love to, we'd love to see you. We have good guest quarters. So right. please come stay. Awesome. Um, and I hope things with your family go okay. I know that's yeah. a hard, hard space to be in. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's down that road. It's been a long road and it's, uh, yeah. you know, we all go through it eventually. <laughs> we, we do, but it's never easy. So no, um, no, I'll, be, I'll be thinking of you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Exactly. Thanks. I appreciate yeah. that. All right. All right. We'll take talk to you care, soon. John. Okay. Take okay. Care. Bye. Bye-bye.